Open uh, your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 6, uh, chapter 5, excuse me. Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll be doing verse 1 through 7. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. Let me open my comments by telling you this, that uh, there's two things I do not like to speak on. Two things I do not like to speak on. One is money. You know, that <laughs> that's always rather difficult. I don't speak on it very often. Mike does a great job in uh, presenting um, uh, our financial situation here and how you can give. And we just trust the Holy Spirit is leading you and how you can help us every week. The other one is morals, moral issues. And that's because both of those are very personal uh, and uh, things that perhaps some people may struggle with more than not. And I want to be careful to frame this so that you understand that, uh, you know, this is all covered by God's grace. It's all covered by his grace and his love and his mercy. I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm here to encourage you, and I'm here to uh, be a blessing to you. So with that, we have over us the banner of God. Over us is love. Love covers a multitude of sins, and we're here to encourage. We're here to help. We're not here to condemn at all. With that, let me read Ephesians 5, 1 through 7. This is from the King James Version. Be ye therefore followers of God as children, and walk in love, as Christ also loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become a saint. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And then following verse 7 here. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we go through these books of the Bible on a verse-by-verse -verse basis, we come upon some great teachings, and then we come upon some sections of Scripture like this. In going through my commentaries and going through uh, messages and, and references and so forth, I have found the majority of the messages on this chapter, particularly the first seven verses, do not include chap uh, chapter uh, 5, uh, starting with verse 3, and going all the way down to verse 7. They skip those. They go from verse 1 and 2 all the way to verse 8. Now, if we're going verse by verse... We have to go through these verses, even though they may not be um, verses that we would want to ponder on very long. But they're very important, particularly in today's culture, in today's society. So we're going to go through them. <laughs> and we're, gonna, we're just going to take apart all of these and uh, just uh, see what God has to say to us this morning. Verse 1, a Christian must imitate the love and forgiveness of God. Verse 1 says, be ye therefore followers of God 
as dear children. He is our heavenly father. We're his earthly family, his earthly children. So God wants us to treat him like a father. We're to obey him. We're to consult with him. We're to pray to him just like we would a good earthly father. And we are to love and forgive like him. In other words, he is our pattern for how we ought to treat other people. Yeah, Paul uses a typical Old Testament phrase in using the sweet-smelling savor. This is found over 50 times in the Old Testament. Over 50 times in the Old Testament. It's the sacrifice of Jesus that's the ultimate of this sweet-smelling savor. Walk in love as God also has loved us and hath given himself uh, as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling faith. Walk in love. Now, how do we do that? It takes a lot of practice. <laughs> uh, some of us are not easy to love. We should have an aura of love about us. That means that we should care about people. Even some we can't be too friendly with because they're not very friendly. But we still have to love them and care about them. And be genuine about that. Walk in love. That's strive in love. Walking our daily walk uh, as we walk and work every single day during the week. How is our guide here? Our guide as Christ also hath loved us. I enjoy being loved by Jesus Christ, don't you? What a privilege that is. What a wonderful blessing that is to be loved of Jesus. And we ought to imitate that as best as we possibly can with people. So he gave himself a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. The sacrifice of animals was really a, uh, a very uh, disastrous thing. You just don't go and kill animals and enjoy it. But in the temple worship, they did that every single day. Just think of that. They had flocks of animals out there in the fields, and they would take one, and they would go in for all kinds of sacrifices, for um, sins forgiven and the sins of the nation, sins of individuals. And it went on all day long. And uh, I, I, as an animal lover, would have a real problem with that, wouldn't you? But the ultimate sacrifice, that was temporary sacrifice. It didn't last very long. With Jesus Christ's sacrifice, it was the ultimate sweet savor to God because it's the ultimate sacrifice that lasts forever. Once and forever, he was sacrificed on the cross. But the effect of that goes out through eternity. And praise God for that. What is a sacrifice? It's perfect obedience to God. We try and be as obedient as we possibly can be. Our young people who are with us, let me give you a clue. You obey your parents. Even uh, those of you that are, that are married, that are young marriage and so forth, you obey your parents. You respect them. They have a whole lot of experience behind them, and they want the best for you in most cases. So you respect them, and, and you love them, and respect what they're saying to you. Jesus did not compromise. He didn't shrink from the cross. He loved us that much. True love is twofold. Let me, let me give you two folds here, as expressed here. True love denies itself. True love denies itself. Jesus, the very Son of God, was rich, but for us, for our sakes, he became poor. He took a body, and in that body he suffered, bled, and died for us. He denied himself. Not my will, but thine be done. He said, I came not to do my will, but the will of the Father. He never performed any miracle for selfish reason or to gain an audience. The love of Jesus is self-denying. 
He gave his life. He gave up all for us. We should be willing to give up all for him. So the first expression of true love is true love denies self. Secondly, Jesus sacrificed all and gave himself an offering to God, a sweet-smelling savor. The sacrifice Jesus made pleased God. Three times in Scripture, in the New Testament, God, in an audible voice, said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Secondly, this is my beloved Son, hear ye him. And then thirdly, I have glorified thy name, and I will glorify thy name on the earth. Let's go on. Verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. In other words, don't have that reputation. We have a reputation to uphold. We have a Savior that... that uh, we are reflecting and living for. Therefore, none of this should be attached anywhere to anybody in any church. And then in verse 4, it goes on and adds this. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now, we are saints. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it just means we're set apart. That's all. We, we don't walk around calling each other St. Joe or St. Barry. That's just awkward, is it? It just means we're set apart. We're sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and uh, we're set apart to do things for the Lord in the, uh, this earth around us. We've been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, First Peter 2.9. It is beneath the dignity of a saint to indulge in the sins that we belong to the world of darkness, some of which Paul names here. When we think we're adopted by the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God the Father is our heavenly Father. All of these things are beneath us. All of these things are not what we're about. And yet culture presses down on us. At every turn, it seems culture is the arch enemy. They want to break us down. This is not easy. There's nothing in these verses that say, hey, this is going to be easy for you. I want you to do it. As we grow older, it doesn't get any easier either. As we grow older, we have to fight even harder. These are the things that really typify the world we live in. And it's fallen so far that this is the accepted day-to-day -day attitude and actions of most people that we're around. Well, the sins described here are those which are prevalent among unbelievers. All of them have to do with low forms of immorality. Paul is saying that the child of God cannot habitually engage in these. Even a slight indulgence in them brings about a revulsion and agony of the soul. It's, folks, we're as vulnerable to these, if not more so, than the world. The world just does this without even thinking. It, it, it's a lifestyle. God wants us to have a lifestyle that's distinctly different. We want to uh, do that by working at it, getting in his word, praying, and watching over ourselves more closely every day. If you can get into sin and not be troubled, you better check up on your salvation. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit indwells us and makes us sensitive for the way we live. He indwells us and makes us sensitive for what we say and what we do. There's a, a sign on Chuck Swindoll's desk in his study that he's had for years, and it's pointed to him. It's not pointed out to his guests. And it says, what is your motive? What is your motive? 
I, 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 in other words, are you doing this to exalt God? Are you doing it because it's right? Are you trying to cut some corners in your life? Are you trying to get away with a few things? And I say this to myself, Barry, are you, are you doing this for the right motives? Do you want to make progress in your life? Do you want to uh, be the Christian that, that people think you are? That's, that's my prayer for me. Barry, you need to be the Christian people think you are. And you need to work harder at these things. And don't let them get a foothold in your life at all. Wake them off immediately. Go to prayer. Have the word in your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, verse 11. That, that, that's the biggest shield that we have and defender that we have is the word of God. It will never lead us astray. The sins here are low sins, which characterizes the ungodly person, most of whom we deal with on a regular basis. Believers need to go to God and tell him what is really in our hearts. You know, it's wonderful to go into the prayer closet, isn't it? Oh, man. I'll tell you, I just love doing that. Go into the prayer closet. Lord, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. It's me again. And boy, do I need to talk to you. Every day, we're living in a lost and fallen world. We're swimming upstream. It's very difficult for us. And we have to go to the Father and be rejuvenated, have more energy, and then to get our orders from him through his word. Now, fornication is a sin. And regardless of where you are or who you are, if you're living in fornication today, you cannot be a child of God. God is going to really work you over. You say, well, I just glanced at that website. Do you know there's over 4,200,000 pornographic websites on the Internet? Did you know that? Do you know that they're visited more times than all of the major websites that we normally use? You put combined together the top three active websites, Facebook and the rest, Put those all together with all the millions of people that use them every day. You combine them all together, and there are more people going to porno sites than there are going to those websites. Just think about that. Worldwide. So we need to be careful what we're watching and what we're going and what we're doing in life. This is, this is where Satan can get a hold of us very, very quickly. Uncleanness includes all form of immorality. Uncleanness in talk, in language that we use. Expressions that are so commonplace. They're unclean. It shouldn't be in the Christian's life. Covetousness may seem to be out of place following fornication and uncleanliness. Covetousness. Well, covetousness is a greedy, selfish desire. We normally hook that up with, uh, well, with money. I mean, you know, he's coveting money. <laughs> the miser thinks dollar bills or hundred dollar bills are flat so he could stack them up and just count them all day long. <laughs> and money is, is a good tool. It, it helps a lot. And if you work hard for it and God is giving you the opportunity to earn money, God bless you. You go and see Mike, and he'll take good care of your, finance, your finances and all that kind of thing so that you have money working for you. But if you're a Christian and God blesses you that way, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to use it wisely and not covet it. There are so many Christians I've known over my 82 years well, that God started to bless materially. And the next thing you know, they thought that money was theirs. 
And so, so they began to use it for themselves and for their family. And then there are others that I saw, some even right here in these seats that you're sitting in, that God began to bless them, and they began to invest that money, and the money began to grow, and they began to invest the money that they got and put it into Christian support, Christian services, Christian churches, missions, and so forth. And God just kept building them up. And they didn't lose their, their love for Jesus over money. So that's what we think of with money, first of all. Secondly, we think of covetousness like this. I want to have my way. I want to uh, be gratified. I want the stimulus of some of this stuff that's on the Internet. That's being covetous. And, and God doesn't allow that to happen and go very far in a Christian's life until you start paying for it. Until you're laying awake at night and until the Holy Spirit is right on your back. And he is not going to allow you to go that far. Now you can override that and you're going to pay a real price for it. The Lord can get pretty severe with us. Just like an earthly father would get pretty severe with us when we're way out of line. When we disrespect our heavenly father, he is going to uh, take us on and straighten us out pretty quick. Now, I don't like saying that. <laughs> I'd rather have a sermon of glory of God, the love of God, and all the other things that we're talking about in Scripture. But this is reality. This is the real Christian life. And when we get out of bounds, we don't get away with it. To the place where the Lord may take us home early. He will fix it one way or the other. So we're being warned of this. In 1 John 2.16 it says, For all uh, that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of this world, 1 John 2.16. So that's not of God, no matter how you cut it. Let not there be a hint of these kinds of sins. It, 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 it troubles me when I hear of pastors. I talked to a pastor friend of mine uh, this past week, and a friend of his in another state uh, had a moral failure. And it's, it's just everywhere. You pray for your pastor, will you please? That I'm human just like anybody else, and that's no excuse. I should be an example to you. But I'm in the same world you are, and I deal with people the same as you do. And it is a fight every single moment of every single day. That's not only you, that's all of us. That's this heathenistic world that we live in and the influence that they have. Verse 4, filthiness speaks of the utmost in depravity. These are the low-down, dirty things one hears every day. <laughs> and boy, do we ever. <laughs> filthiness. People don't call it that anymore. I remember I came home as a little guy. I was probably, I don't know, six or seven. And uh, I said a bad word. Now, that's hard to believe, isn't it? I mean, that I would do that. And I had a mother that said, what did you say? I didn't know any better. I heard the guys talking, you know, the big guys. So I said it again. And she grabbed me up and took me into the bathroom and got a bar of soap. Did any of you have this happen to you? Oh, oh, that stuff tastes awful. Man, I was very careful what I said beyond that point. That's a hard lesson to learn, isn't it? But you know what? I learned a lesson, and it stuck with me for a long, long time. And that's the way it is with God. She did that so that I would learn something. She did that because she saw it would be harmful to me if she didn't do it. Boy, that was a lesson I'll never forget, believe me. Filthiness. That's what she called it. You're filthy. 
Most people we run into today are filthy and they don't even know it. That's why we need to be showing the living the gospel in front of them so that they know there's a contrast there in our lives. Verse uh, 4b, foolish talking. What does foolish talking mean? Well, it means senseless conversation in the Greek. Senseless. Make, uh, it's not worth anything. It's just idle talk. Someone bragging. You know, some of them call it bar talk, you know, where you get a few beers in you and uh, you just start spouting off things. It cheapens the man and does not edify or minister grace to the hearts, according to Ephesians 4.29. What does the word jesting mean? What does the word jesting mean? Well, it means to make light of sensuality and immorality. How much better it is for us to be quick to give thanks to the Lord, to bless his name. You know, uh, yesterday I was at the warehouse and we had 14 guys there. And well, you came toward the end of our, of our time together. These guys are, some of them are pretty rough, <laughs> I have to say. But I told them, I said, it's time for us, we're going to be leaving. Uh, may I pray for you? And you know what they did? We we're all sitting in a circle. I got up and hold, held hands, and they let me pray for them. We have some fellows that are in uh, the hospital. We had one fellow that had a mild heart attack, and we prayed for him. And I laid the gospel out. As best as I could in that prayer. Jesus, we thank you for your son, Father. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior of the world, who died on that cross, that cruel cross, and took our lashes and died on that cross for us. Died on that cross for us personally. He's a personal Savior. <laughs> I'm amazed they let me get away with that. I just pushed it as far as I could. And I said, if there's anybody in this circle that's never given their life to Jesus Christ, may this be the time that the Holy Spirit speaks to their heart and they give their life to Jesus and leave all this stuff behind. Well, no one said amen. <laughs> if I don't take that responsibility, who is going to do that? Who's going to bring that up before these men? Well, I don't know if they like it or not, but they keep letting me do it, so I'm just going to keep on doing it until they tell me to stop. And then I might keep on doing it as well. Listen, folks, we are the contrast. We're the people that set the bounds. We're the ones that are the example that they have to put up with when they see you at work. When they see you at school, when they see you in a the neighborhood, they know they're convicted because of you and the life you're living and the language you use and the things that you use your time for. Amen. I'm not getting an amen. Anybody out there? Hey. All right. Thank you. That came from way in the back. You guys down front, you need another dip in that in, in that. Uh, <laughs> In that baptistry, I got foolish talking, jesting. Those are the kinds of things that just, just turn us around. It's just so lousy. Uh, Colossians 3.16 says this. On the other hand, let the word of Christ dwell in you, what? Richly. In other words, it has a great value to you. You want to study it, memorize it, apply it. And that shows that it's meaningful in your life. And it goes on and says this, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Oh, I like that. Yeah. You know, uh, Neff gets that guitar out, gets it all tuned up and ready to go, and man, here we go, brother. Don't you enjoy that? You know, on my phone, I have uh, uh, links to all kinds of gospel stuff. Oh, boy, I'm telling you, it just is great music, praising God. And it helps me get off the day and helps me throughout the whole day to walk with the Lord as best as I can. 
What a blessing Christian music is. Colossians 4, 6 says this. Now, this is talking about our speech. It's not useless. It's not a waste of time. Let your speech be also with what? Grace. Grace. Forgiveness. Un un unmerited favor for people. People that may have wronged you. You let your speech be full of grace. Seasoned with salt. You ever had food that, you know, when Sandy goes on a diet, everybody goes on a diet in the house. That's kind of the way things work, right, Sid? You know, wait, wow, wait a minute. There's no salt on there. It's not supposed to have salt. Oh, boy, it's pretty bland, isn't it? Our, our speech should be seasoned with salt. <laughs> At least it has some uh, taste to it, right? That ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. With grace. You know, everybody needs grace from people. Everybody. There's not one of you that have come in these doors this morning to this great crowd we have that doesn't have a challenge or going through a trial or something in your life that's heavy on your heart. Every single one of us this morning right here has that. We need grace we need grace from each other. We need to love one another. We need to care genuinely about one another. Christians who have God's words in their heart will always season their speech with salt. For grace in the heart means grace on the lips. I love that quote. Oh, that's so good. Grace in our hearts produces grace in our speech. But rather, give him thanks, is to be an element of the Christian conversation. Verse 5 says this, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Wow! That, just, just think of that for a moment. They don't think they're a whoremonger. They, they don't characterize themselves like that. Oh, I like the lady. No, you don't. That's not right at all. So, uh, well, I'm kind of an unclean person. I use a few words here and there. And I, I kind of excuse it away. Uh, God doesn't excuse it away. Well, I'm kind of a covetous man. I, I like my dollars and I like to, to have nice things. You're an adulterer. You're an idolater. You're idolizing something. You, you, you have something there. All of these people are condemned. Every one of them. I'm not condemning them. This church isn't condemning them. The word of God is condemning them. And it says they have an inheritance in the kingdom, have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Uh, John 3.3 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. These people need to be born again. We talk of our missionaries, our three missionary families that we support every month. And boy, they're out in some tough areas. We are too. You're a missionary. You're a minister. Every one of you. You're a missionary. And this can be a more difficult mission station than the darkest part of Africa. Who knows? But we need to be about being a missionary for God because all these people that have all of these proclivities, no whoremonger, unclean person, covetous person, or an adult. That's a lot of folks, my friends. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall do this. Judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. 2 Timothy 4.1. 2 Timothy 4.1. He's going to judge. I was talking to a gentleman yesterday about that. We'll all stand before God. We all are going to give an account. Now for us, it's an account of what we've done in service for the Lord. Our salvation is not at all at that judgment. For the vast majority of people, they're going to give account of these descriptions in their life. How they have lived these things out. They'll give an account. Furthermore, God has it all on tape. And he's going to be showing what goes on. Every thought 
everything. There's no idle word with God. Do you think you're getting away with bar talk? There's no idle word with him. You're going to give an account for it. Now, I'm not that severe, but God is. Because he wants you to, uh, to give your life to Jesus Christ and live for the Lord. And get rid of all of this stuff in your life. It goes on. Hey, Galatians 5.21. If you turned on the news this past week, <laughs> I, I'm avoiding it now. You see what's on the news? I mean, there are people pulling guns and shooting one another point blank. Just, life means nothing. Years ago, Mother Teresa said, if we don't regard life in the womb, it'll soon be we won't regarding life at all. And that's come our way. That's exactly where we are right now. We don't regard life. The people out there are killing one another. So Galatians 5.21 says, envying. Do you envy people that have things that you may not have? Murderers, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now we've got a bunch of left-wing judges that are letting people out. Murderers. Manslaughter people. They're letting them out without bail and putting them back on the streets in some of these cities. It's lawlessness. Our judicial system is so squeamy and so uh, without a backbone nowadays. How are you going to rehabilitate people when you let them loose on the street and they go out and murder again? Listen, that's not the way God handles things, folks. He says, I don't care what the Supreme Court says or a politician or a judge or a mayor. I don't care what they say. These people will not inherit the kingdom of God, period. Now, how many preachers are saying that today? If this church and other churches sticks by preaching the word of God, we're going to be way out of step. We already are way out of step with the whole world, it seems, right? But that doesn't change what the Bible says. And it doesn't change how we ought to live. Man, I, I'll tell you, it's just so difficult out there. Now, here's, here's a, a word I want to go back to, whoremonger, because it comes up so often. It's a Greek word, pornos, which we get our word pornography from, by the way. It means one who practices fornication and illicit sex acts. The morality, unclean, and covetous will join a fornicator in judgment. Paul equates covetousness with idolatry, for it is a worship of something other than God. These warnings deal with the habitual practice of sin and not the occasional act of sin. There are people that have their first drink. There are guys that I, you know, they knew I didn't drink when I got to be a Christian in high school. So I'd be the designated driver. They go out and get plastered and brag about it the next day. Boy, I just got plastered. It's good. They used to call me the deacon. It's good the deacon was with us. We couldn't have gotten home otherwise. What's good about that? What's good about waking up with a hangover? What's good about acting like an animal like that? Listen, folks, I had to break away from those people. I just couldn't take it anymore. God wants us to separate ourselves from folks like that. The unregenerate man who practices sins has no place in the kingdom of God. That's for sure. Verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. We're saved by grace and we don't have vain words. The words we use have purpose and meaning and power. And that's the way we live, which is a total contrast to just about 99% of the people that we run into. Romans 6, 1 and 2 said this, Therefore go ahead and sin that God's grace might abound. Question mark, should we do that? Paul answers, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Well, <laughs> we'll finish up with this. The child of God cannot participate uh, in these kinds of things. 
and he'll bring displeasure upon his life. Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 31, 32 says this. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. In other words, you judge yourself so that God doesn't have to judge you. You be hard on yourself at times so that God doesn't have to judge you. And it goes on to say, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32. There are many possessors, but few many professors and few possessors. Matthew 7, 21, 23 says this. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? You do you see those televangelists that do that stuff? Well, and in thy name done many wonderful works and then I will profess unto them I never knew you depart from me that ye that work iniquity there's going to be a lot of surprised people at the judgment seat of Christ verse 7 be not ye therefore partakers with them there comes a time when a child of God just has to separate himself as best as he possibly can from people it's just not going to it's just fruitless to tr keep trying. Some people are just so far gone that God has given them up. And if we see this working the other way where it has an impact on our lives, it's best for us to just separate ourselves from people. I trust that you did that when you got saved. There were people in my life when I got saved I had to separate myself from them. I couldn't pal around with them anymore. I couldn't be around them with the things they were doing. Or it would have been uh, very difficult on my Christian life and my uh, Christian witness and terrible. 1 Corinthians 5.10 says that, Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, nor with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, we're to separate ourselves from them. For then, for them must ye needs go out of the world. We've got to separate ourselves, folks, and that's hard to do. 1 Corinthians 5.10. Well, let's finish up. I don't mean to be harsh. But I see things creeping into the fundamental evangelical churches today that I never thought I'd see happen. It has split the great Methodist church right down the middle. When you don't take the word of God as your roadmap, I don't care if you're a bishop, the pope, or whoever you are, you are wrong. And when you take it to the extent where you say, well, we don't think God meant this about homosexuals. We don't think God meant this about these other groups of people. We don't think God meant it when these people are unclean vessels, unusable by God. We don't think, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the churches that don't believe that stuff and we're going to form another denomination and we're going to split this denomination right down the middle. That's what happens when you have people practicing this kind of a lifestyle in the church. And I talk to, I have some Methodist pastors, friends of mine, who are split between them. And one of them, who's a good friend of mine back home in Pennsylvania, he got pretty nasty with me on the phone. Because he asked what I believe, and I said, I believe the Bible. I believe what the Word of God says. And that's the way I'm going to go. And you guys are just, you guys, God is going to judge you for this. I was working on this message, and I said, here's what the Bible says. That's the ultimate thing, not your book of worship or anything handed down by the denomination. This is the word of God. It's eternal, unalterable, inerrant. So someone's right and someone's wrong. I didn't say I'm right and you're wrong, but I just let it at that. Listen, friends, it can happen to any denomination. 
My friends in the Southern Baptist Church are having some problems with this. They're investigating their own organization now because it's been covered up. Who would think that a denomination like that? Oh, friends, look. We don't have long to go. The writing is there on the wall. I just urge everybody in the sound of my voice and the people that are listening to us in our extended congregation around the world, we don't have much time left. God's holding the door open for you. He's giving you an opportunity to leave all of this black stuff behind and have a new life in Jesus Christ and leave hell behind and have heaven in front of you. That's what he's trying to say to you through all of this. Amen? Let's pray. Father, um, this is hard stuff. Um, I really thought carefully about not going through this paragraph alone. But we need to know this. We need to be, I need to know it, and I be, need to be reminded of how harsh this is, how ugly it is, but yet it's prevalent in our world. So we just ask, Father, that anybody within the sound of my voice is, that has this kind of lifestyle, we ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit would just uh, speak to them, that they would uh, come under conviction by the Holy Spirit, and they would uh, confess their sins to Jesus, give their life over to him by faith, and step out and be counted for the gospel and for Jesus Christ and start living for the Lord. Father, may that be true. There may be someone here in this great auditorium that uh, may have never given their life to Jesus Christ. And we just pray, Father, this would be the day whether you're listening around the world or in our auditorium. You can pray this prayer. Lord, thank you for dying on that cross for me personally, for my personal sins, for all of these black things that we've been talking about here. You have grace and mercy. Thank you so much. And I give my life over to you. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me now for your name's sake. The Bible says you do the asking and he'll do the saving. He will in no wise cast anybody out who comes to him in faith. We're grateful for that, Father. And I just give my life to you. I will live for you. I will serve you. I will represent you. The time that you give me here on earth. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying that price and having mercy upon me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.